All right. If you can't see this or you can't hear me talking, well, it's probably not a good thing, but let me know. We can see it. We're good. Good deal. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start. So the, the title of today's talk is Type 1 Diabetes Outcomes, Therapies, and Future Innovations. Um, a highlight of this talk, obviously, is going to be revolving around nutrition and potential role it may have in this disease management. Um, as an introduction to myself, as William had asked me to do, uh, I'm Andrew Kudnick. I have a doctorate in biomedical sciences and a background in exercise physiology and biomedical sciences, uh, uh, going all the way back to Florida State, where I trained on um, looking at unique interventions to mitigate either disease. A lot of this was mental health uh, related and looking at cardiovascular and autonomic function. Uh, then I transitioned to look at lifestyle as an intervention uh, with a lot of that work focused around low carbohydrate diets and or ketone metabolism and how they may or may not play a role in health disease and performance applications. Uh, we also did some other work during that time. I, I ran two projects on a NASA related project during that period and then went to work with a institute that was specifically studying um, diet mimetics, things called like ketone, exogenous ketone bodies uh, in unique special populations, uh, military populations. So we did a lot of Department of Defense work and NASA work. So, uh, and now I've, and have been for the last over, well, for a long period of time, uh, but have been increasingly more and more focused of my time and efforts in type 1 diabetes. In fact, I've made a major transition recently to exclusively try to work on type 1 diabetes to advance outcomes, of which I'll be talking about here today. Uh, so I have, uh, so I do have a Twitter. I do actually keep active on Twitter. I used to hate social media, but I find it's an unbelievably valuable opportunity to, to share a message, connect, and learn a, a lot. So I do engage on that now. Um, and I was a full-time research scientist at Institute for Human and Machine Cognition and Human Health Span Resilience Performance, but actually backed off my effort and went to a visiting science position to advance what I'm doing in type 1 diabetes. Disclosures, I do have them. I don't know if I have to give this or not, but I, I, I think it's relevant for everyone to know. I received funding from the Department of Defense, Office of Native Research, Defense Advanced Research Program Agency. I have received honorariums from ACSM, my University of Miami, Stanford Metabolic Health Summit, and I have been on grant panels for the Department of Defense before and got paid to do so. Uh, I am a patent inventor, but what I am a patent inventor on is not relevant to what we're speaking about here today. And I have consulted for Simply Good Foods, not a physician, uh, not medical advice. So table of contents. So today's talk is going to first discuss type 1 diabetes as a disease. So what is the disease itself? What is the glycemic impact of this disease? Uh, and then ultimately, what are the outcomes? And what are the therapeutic interventions to patients who have this disease? And I want to back up for a second. The reason I'm talking about this today and why I'm particularly passionate about it is because I've been living with this disease for a decade and a half. I myself have type 1 diabetes and also happen to have studied uh, this disease and also implications of lifestyle, not only in this disease, but other diseases. So I'm very, very passionate about this topic on a personal level, but also from an advocacy level and a research perspective. Uh, then we're going to talk about nutrition, something I also studied for over a decade. Uh, and this is looking at dietary impacts. I want to define uh, what we're talking about when we talk about nutrition, uh, past and present evidence, concerns, criticism, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about type 1 diabetes, uh, you know, the stats right now say that one in 300 people have type 1 diabetes. Now, that number is growing, um, but the, the previous numbers indicated such is the case. And the question is, well, why me? Why Andrew Kutnick was I diagnosed with this disease? And at present, we don't completely understand it. But what we do appreciate is it appears to be that our body causes an autoimmune reaction. Our immune cells ultimately target and kill part of our body that produces insulin. These are the beta cells in the pancreas. So in essence, for those who are not familiar, I imagine most are, especially William, because you're interested in hormones, uh, but our body essentially plays a thermostat. So as the temperature or as the blood sugar in the body from things like uh, carbohydrate-based foods are consumed, blood sugar goes up, our body does a great job of detecting and then ultimately releasing insulin in a dose-dependent and appropriate manner to bring down those blood sugars into normal homeostatic and healthy ranges. Uh, but in the absence of that, things change pretty robustly and we lose that control. So when we talk about uh, type 1 diabetes, 
I'm going to give a little bit more of a descriptive visual presentation of what that actually means from a dietary perspective. And the best way to illustrate that is, of course, carbohydrates. It doesn't obviously have to be a donut. It could be any food. It's just a great example because I think it gives an extreme example and people know immediately what it means. But any carb that comes in of any sort, uh, ultimately, when it's consumed, it could be potatoes, it could be rice, it could be this donut. Um, it could be uh, squash, although it has more fiber and much less glycemic impact. But all of these, when they're consumed, will ultimately raise blood sugar in a dose-dependent manner related to the amount of carbs consumed. Of course, the pancreas will detect these levels in the beta cells and ultimately release an appropriate amount of insulin into circulation. This insulin will act to store this blood glucose uh, primarily when endogenously released uh, into the uh, or uh, allow for insulin to bind to the liver and ultimately cause uh, glucose to be stored in the, the liver tissue. Also, peripheral tissues like muscle as an energy substrate and also be converted to fat as a uh, fuel substrate in, in that form. But and ultimately, that brings down glucose into a normal homeostatic range. This is the purpose of insulin primarily, most people would argue so. But when the uh, immune cells come in and ultimately destroy part of the pancreas that produces these insulin uh, producing uh, cells, the beta cells, we lose the ability to store these molecules and ultimately blood sugar stays up and, and uh, high in response to food in the absence of this insulin. And of course, that's just showing uh, an elevation of blood glucose. So ultimately, a patient with type 1 diabetes, as, as i.e. myself, has an outtake exogenous forms of insulin because my body doesn't produce anymore. And this is just an example of no vlog, but right here in front of me, I have two types of insulin. I just took my basal insulin that I usually take at night because here on the Eastern time zone, it's, it's eight o'clock. So um, I, we take these insulins and ultimately this was found to be a life-saving drug for many patients with type 1 diabetes back in 1922, I believe, and ultimately ended in the Nobel Prize and has basically extended the life of patients with my disease from anywhere from uh, days, uh, maybe and for lucky two to three years prior to the onset of insulin to um, actually uh, a normal, uh, well, almost normal lifespan, which we'll speak about here today. So when we talk about the elevation and, and glucose, when we talk about uh, what this elevated glucose uh, effects could be, what are these effects? Why would we care to, about these elevated blood sugar levels? Well, on the left graph, there is uh, someone who does not have type 1 diabetes and, it, it, and has normal blood sugar regulation. And you can see in that normal range, the bottom range, of 70 and the top range of 120, uh, the blood sugar is reliably staying within this range uh, for the vast majority of the day. But on the right-hand side, you can see the illustration. I've actually myself, when I was on a, a standard uh, uh, American diet, and you can see at almost every single meal, the uh, upward swing in glucose and the come crashing down after the injection of insulin, that's very symbolic of what most patients experience on a diet such as uh, any standard diet and taking exogenous insulin. But as you see, the vast majority of the day for someone, in, in this case, a single example of myself, um, but actually a lot of patients, actually the vast majority of patients experience the same thing, uh, living the vast majority of their life well outside of the normal range of 70 to 120, where you can accumulate symptoms of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, a lot of which are mental health symptoms, um, as well as things like fatigue, irritability, and, and ultimately inability to uh, think optimally, such as disrupted concentration and otherwise. But these can also be fatal scenarios. Uh, hyperglycemia and uncontrollably can ultimately, can in some circumstances lead to diabetic ketoacidosis. Any physicians listening here will understand that DKA um, is potentially fatal if not treated within uh, a short period of time. Uh, usually patients find out they have type 1 diabetes when they go to the hospital with DKA. Now in the hypoglycemia and most physicians are very, very terrified of this uh, because it's very, it could happen quickly. I could take the wrong amount of insulin right now and two hours from now I could be in a hypoglycemic coma. That's how risky it gets every single day of every meal for someone with type one diabetes. And ultimately you can go unconscious, you can have a coma of Caesar and ultimately death. Um, so the consequences uh, of this disease and its management and I have to do so every single day without the help of anyone else uh, is very real. So uh, the question is, what are the average outcomes? So I'm saying, I'm telling you, okay, this, this graph on the right-hand side is what we expect to see in a type one diabetic population, but does that really represent the norms? 
And this is actually a, uh, a cluster of studies looking at some of the most advanced technologies. So in this case, looking at uh, studies that looked at uh, standard of care versus things like closed loop technologies. Now closed loop technologies, for those who aren't familiar, is actually these innovative next generation technologies that actually take insulin along with devices called continuous glucose monitors, which continuously monitor your glucose levels and automatically through computer algorithms releases uh, insulin in a, in, a, in a level to ultimately regulate your blood sugar level. But what you find is that the average, even in these, uh, these studies, is still 164 milligrams per deciliter with a standard deviation of 63. Now, when you compare that to studies using similar devices in normal, healthy, non-diabetic populations, you can see with even the best next generation technology and pharmacology available to type 1 diabetes, most patients are, are uh, creeping up of almost double the mean blood glucose, and they are four times larger in their variance in blood sugar levels as well, usually fluctuating a, a totality of over 120 milligrams per deciliter uh, uh, around their mean. But what are we, what, what beyond that? What about uh, more chronic levels of blood glucose? Well, what I showed you before is a trace, uh, previously is tracing some continuous monitoring of glucose, which happens minute by minute in patients with new technology. But what we've usually looked at historically when we consider um, risk, is uh, uh, something called HbA1c. Now, it was discovered, I believe, back in the 1960s, if I'm correct, um, where they found that a, a subunit of the hemoglobin molecule called the a A1c subunit actually had more glucose binding to it as glucose levels were readily higher on average. Uh, and they found this in type 2 diabetic patients. And it wasn't here in the United States. I forget which country it was. I think it might have been Afghanistan. Um, it, it was definitely an African country, but either way, uh, they found that elevations in this glycosylation of the hemoglobin molecule occurred as blood sugar got higher more readily across patients. And over time, we have come to appreciate, especially with big trials, such as the DCC and EDICT, that was a hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars put into it, that have allowed us to appreciate that the elevation in HbA1c is directly linked to increase acute and chronic complications a particular microvascular complications such as um, retinopathy, uh, kidney disease, and, and neuropathy. In fact, most patients with type 1 diabetes are expected uh, to get retinopathy within two decades of diagnosis, or at least some form of it, um, at, before it gets fully progressive. So this is just an illustration of studies also confirming or showing uh, across a number of studies, international studies at that, some of which are some of, from some of the best institutions in the world, including that Foster et al. 2019. That's actually from a cluster of the best 30 institutes in the United States from the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange, amongst others around the world, showing that across some of the largest data sets we have available to us, that the average HbA1c across all these studies is, is around 8.2. Now, normal HbA1c is less than 5.7, uh, meaning that uh, usually somewhere in the low two, uh, five range, as you can illustrate uh, below here in larger data sets of the US population of non-diabetic cohorts, so healthy cohorts, you can see the patients are living well above the normal range on an average basis. And those who are most affected are actually kids. Kids are usually the ones who have the uh, worst, like, worst end glycemic control. Uh, until they get into their adult years. Um, and so this is kind of disheartening, of course, to see that patients on average, even with the most advanced technologies and pharmacologies available to them, still fail to uh, get anywhere close to what would be deemed normal. And that's ultimately the goal of any disease, right? When you have a disease, you hope that you can go to the doctor and, and walk into the clinic and they say, well, yeah, you have this, this new disease, but hey, we have a solution to get you just like your, your friend down the street but you have to do things a little differently. Well, that's not an option, or at least it doesn't appear to be based on the most advanced technologies to type one diabetes, or based on this evidence. And unfortunately, based on the most uh, up-to-date evidence, this is a study in 2000, well, it was it, it was looking at comparison of two different decades from uh, 2020 or 2010 to 2012, compared to uh, 2016 and 2018, so essentially a, a, a decade. Uh, they looked at the, 30 best institutes, diabetic institutes in the United States. So some of the most, in fact, the most premier institutes in diabetes, 
and looked at their average outcomes in HbA1c and what was happening. As you can see, that blue line is an illustration that even with more improved technology over the last decade, uh, the rates of HbA1c are actually rising. They're, they were, they're not improving, they're regressing. Um, in spite of these advancements, and there is a number of reasons that might be facilitating that, but suffice it to say, the theme here is that things were not good and they don't appear to be getting better, particularly the focus on glycemic control. So why do we care about glycemic control? Well, uh, as said, you know, we know the type 1 diabetics are about 1.6 times higher, even with the most advanced technologies available to them to compare to the general population. We know the standard deviation around uh, their glycemic norms is about 4.2 times higher, and their HbA1c is about 1.5 times higher and worsening. Uh, but what are these outcomes? Why, why, why do we even care? If these blood sugar levels don't translate to anything, then we don't care, right? Well, they do. And this is just one illustration of what that looks like in one of the largest uh, uh, cohorts in type 1 diabetics out of Sweden, uh, where they looked at uh, a number of metrics, one of which was uh, looking at many of the top 10 leading causes of death around the world. And every single one of these on the left-hand side, cancer, heart disease, et cetera, um, anywhere where I highlight in, in red is an illustration of where there's an increased risk for a patient with type 1 diabetes. And, and suffice to say, they looked at males and females and type 1 diabetic versus the general population across all age groups. And what we see here is that almost, if not all of these conditions have elevated risk for type 1 diabetic patients, um, some of which are, are arguably invisible diseases, such as mental health disorders um, as well. But that's not really the worst of it. We actually know that patients with type 1 diabetes are expected to live about a, a little over a decade shorter with females getting it a little worse. And the data actually says that the earlier you're diagnosed, the worse it is. So there's good evidence now to say from the best trials we have available to us, that even if you correct your blood sugar levels and improve it later on in life, you don't completely reverse the prior bad blood sugar levels that you had. So the earlier we can correct these problems, the better. But uh, even with the best and most advanced technologies, uh, e those patients are still expected to live uh, less about 10 to 11, sorry, 11 to 13 years shorter lifespan with this disease. Now there's a published study that came out uh, in 20, so essentially last month, uh, September, 2020, and they were looking at 96 different countries. So this is the largest data set uh, that I have heard of in type one diabetes. And they looked at 96 different countries and they were looking at a modeling study and it was published in a very high profile diabetes journal, one of the most uh, high profile. And what they found was that the diabetic population was expected to double by 2040. Uh, in the next 20 years, it's expected to double. But of the current 8.4 million uh, patients with type 1 diabetes worldwide, 30.6% of that population, so over 3 million, I think it was 3.7 million, had, would have been alive today, but were not. They had died because of some complication related to type 1 diabetes and early death. Um, meaning that we're, we, we currently have lost a third of our, uh, our community uh, to early deaths related to this disease. And it's, this disease is not going away. It's expected to increase in incidence even more. Um, and uh, this data is just reconfirming some of what I've told you already. This is the most recent data that has come out on looking at lifespan expectancy. This is the most robust data I've actually ever seen, um, uh, I've ever published. They looked at every single individual country and then categorized them by high, upper, middle, lower, middle, and low income countries. And what you see is the high income countries, those numbers match quite expectingly with the Swedish population, also the US population at 11 years lost. But as you go down the social economic ladder on a global scale, you start to see that these numbers get from 11 years to 24 years to 36 years to 47 years lost. So over half the life expectancy of an individual is gone if you're on the very low end in a country that is in the low income uh, countries. Uh, th this is, in my opinion, as a patient, completely unacceptable. Now, what about increased risk and outcomes? Well, we know in total that the acute complications of this disease include things like hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia symptoms, a lot of which are mental health symptoms. 
uh, severe hypoglycemia in, in the form of emergencies like coma or seizures, and ultimately diabetic ketoacidosis. But we also know the chronic complications that come with this disease that are well cited, including microvascular disease and infinitely higher macrovascular disease risk and increased risk for alternate leading causes of death, shortened life expectancy, uh, 11 to 18 years, depending on where you live. And that really only encompasses uh, the higher income countries, the lower income countries, we're looking at uh, anywhere between two to four decades loss. And obviously other conditions such as psychiatric disorder, stunted growth and cognitive decline. We know that kids with type 1 diabetes, um, because of the worsening glycemic control, can actually see brain MRI changes, so their uh, neuroanatomy changes, within three years of being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and we also know that, uh, that their IQ begins to drop as well. And all these are linked to glycemic control. In fact, the only thing that truly is changing in a type 1 diabetic, besides the slight alteration in the immune response to a part of our own body, is truly just losing the ability to produce insulin and then ultimately control glucose. Type 1 diabetics are usually normal weight, usually have normal lipids. Uh, the rest of these other categories are typically normal, but the one thing, not the only thing, but the primary one thing that changes with type 1 diabetes is glycemic control. And everything on the left-hand side there has been linked to it. So what therapeutic options do patients with my disease currently have to regulate this disease and improve it? And I must say, we've come a very, very long way. Uh, I, in fact, use uh, some of these tools uh, right now. For example, um, I wear a continuous glucose monitor um, on a regular basis. It's a, a wonderful tool, and it gives you a continuous reading of your blood sugar over e almost every single minute of uh, every single day and gives you examples of, I don't know if you guys can see this or not, because the camera's probably not zooming in very well. But either way, so I, I regularly use these tools. They're incredible. Um, but some of the, the options to give you a breath of what's out there is most patients when they're diagnosed, they, they start doing something called a carbohydrate counting strategy, which is you count the amount of carbohydrates you consume and you learn to bolus a certain amount of insulin accordingly for how many carbs you take. There's other tools like an insulin pump. So instead of having to take syringes, which I have here with insulin, uh, every single day and actually stick a you know syringe into your stomach or your arm or wherever it might be, they have these continuous infusion pumps, which lowers the visual burden of this disease and also the uh, necessity to continuously inject yourself. There are tools like a continuous glucose monitor, which I already spoke about. And there's the idea of linking the pump with the CGM together to automatically release insulin, some of which I spoke to you about earlier, about some of the numbers you expect to achieve with type 1 diabetes with these devices. Now, this is just an illustration of some of those tools, both current and exploratory. And I won't go through each one, um, but I just wanna just quickly state that there's only two therapies on this list amongst those that are currently available and exploratory that actually have reduced insulin uh, on, on total at least one absolute unit point. So this one is intensive treated therapy. This is the DCC and EDIC trial where they found that just injecting more than uh, two times per day, which was standard of care before this trial came out, improved glycemic control in spite of increasing the total, total insulin load and body weight of patients with type 1 diabetes. They still had better outcomes uh, in response to lower, improving their glycemic control. Uh, but this is the only intervention that has reliably improved glycemic control through the form of HbA1c more than one absolute unit point except this one down here, which is islet cell transplant therapy. So there was a study in 2000 that came out uh, that actually illustrated uh, the ability to completely normalize uh, glucose control within three months of uh, a patient undergoing this therapeutic intervention. The only caveat to that intervention is that islet cell transplant therapies require a major surgical intervention. They require you to be on a chronic immunosuppressants, only a subset of a very, very small subset of the diabetic population who have asymptomatic hypoglycemia and potentially uh, pre-existing microvascular disease is even eligible for it. And uh, most patients who get on these transplant therapies uh, ultimately end up re having their islet cell transplants regress and they end up having an HbA1c that ends up getting back up to 6.5 and they end up getting a, a subset of these population gets back on insulin. So ultimately these, this is not available to everyone but not also universally successful, but there is some hope within these therapies for sure um, if they can ever get around to fixing the immune system, which is a hell of a problem 
to understand and then fix. So we're not there yet and might not be for quite some time. So all these things combined, the, the idea that glucose control is paramount to the disease, the, the inability to control with advanced technologies and tools available to us, the direct link between this poor glycemic control and type one diabetes, in fact, the worsening glycemic control we've seen in the last decade, and it's linked to both acute and chronic complications as well as other conditions in a shortened lifespan, it may lead patients to think, what about diet? <clears throat> is there a role for diet? Does it matter and can it have an impact? Well, this is an illustration of fat, protein, and carbohydrates and the impact it can actually have on our blood sugar level. Obviously, blood sugar is a centralized theme of what we're talking about here today because that's what patients with my disease ultimately cannot control anymore. Uh, and we know that fat can have an effect on blood sugar level using a dose-dependent manner, but it's, it's, it's marginal at best. Um, now, protein, we know protein can have an elevation of, uh, in blood sugar levels, but usually in patients who have normal, or let's say not patients, so those without type 1 diabetes would never even see an elevation in their CGM reading if they were one in response to protein because the body is so quickly uh, handles the elevation in glucose in response to protein. It's much smaller and more prolonged than carbohydrates. We know that carbohydrates are ultimately the most profound postprandial impact on, on uh, glucose levels. Uh, they're rapidly absorbed and have uh, a dose-dependent response in the amount of, uh, of glucose elevating effect proportional to the grams of carbohydrates ingested. But keep in mind that all these illustrations, uh, I mean, you know, these are just uh, I, uh, ways of visualizing the total impact of these on glycemia, are all in the context of insulin. Patients with my disease don't have insulin. They have to inject it. So in the absence of insulin, what ends up happening is the rise is actually much larger and continuous until the injection of insulin occurs. Now, it is important to appreciate, and I'll just reiterate some of these things I've already said, is that acute carbohydrates, uh, what is that impact? Well, we know it's the most potent lifestyle factor on postprandial, so post-meal hyperglycemia, so elevations in blood sugar above the normal upper level threshold. We also know that uh, the most potent uh, factor for hypoglycemia in the type one diabetics life is insulin. We also know that insulin and carbohydrates are directly linked to each other. So the more carbs you consume, the more insulin you require. Um, and this is a direct relationship. So these are the two most important factors and they're directly linked to one another. So could we do something about modulating something like this? Well, let's first define the idea of a low carbohydrate diet because the idea and the theme here is if you have a lot of carbohydrates in your diet, and it's directly linked to insulin, and we know that elevation in blood glucose levels will have worse outcomes, what if we just reduce the amount of carbohydrates in the food uh, and reduce subsequently the amount of insulin required on a regular basis, and thus the amount of medications and hypoglycemic agents put into the body? But first, let, let's define what we're talking about when we talk about diets that are reduced in carbohydrates. We're usually talking about diets that are uh, low or absent in sugary starchy carbohydrates that the form of the diet that is most associated with many of the quote, popular benefits or health benefits of low carb diets are actually termed very low carbohydrate diets. And they're less, usually less than 50 grams of carbohydrates per day. You can look in the published literature right now and find all sorts of studies that talk about high fat diets or low carbohydrate diets. These are not necessarily the same thing. Many of those diets are actually much higher in carbohydrates, encroaching on the levels of a Western diet, which is high in carbs and high in fat. And this is not similar. In fact, dissimilar, dissimilar to this dietary strategy. So to just define it, most of the time when we talk about benefits of a very low carbohydrate diet, it's in this low carbohydrate range. And we know objectively, these dietary strategies can ultimately result, not always, but often result in elevation of ketone bodies in the body, and, and production of ketones in the body through something called ketogenesis, where the body switches its fuel substrate, primary fuel substrate from glucose over to fat. And a sign of that is the elevation of ketone bodies because ketone, ketogenesis is a byproduct of fat oxidation. Now, when we talk about defining these diets, the various forms of, of carbohydrates in the diet, where do these definitions come from? So the definitions I'm giving here today ha have actually been uh, historically given by the American Diabetes Association, uh, United States or US, I'll just say USDA because most people know what that is. 
and then human health services. Uh, these definitions are high carbohydrate, moderate carbohydrate, low carbohydrate, and very low carbohydrate diet. As a quick glance on these though, the, the high, moderate, and low carbohydrate diet is based on intake norms and not based on the type one diabetes uh, population needs. And they're not objectively defined. Whereas these bottom uh, categories are based on a, a physiological phenotype, a physiological state, it are objectively defined where the popularity arises. To quickly go through this, high carbohydrates were originally defined by the ADA, USDA, and the Human Health Services as the recommended carbohydrate intake for health. Now, those reasons were based on diets uh, higher in carbohydrates, like a Mediterranean, not necessarily Mediterranean diet per se, but diets higher in carbohydrates has, has shown some health benefits in the literature. And also because generally most people were consuming that many carbohydrates. So the assumption was, okay, well, we're gonna define hard carbohydrate based on general intake norms and prior recommendations of carbohydrate intake by the governing bodies. Well, moderate carbohydrate just came in because it was between high carb and low carb. Low carb was defined because it was once believed that 130 grams of carbohydrates per day was required for optimal brain health function. We know that uh, brain, the brain can function optimally on zero carbohydrates per day. Uh, and you actually don't need any consumption of carbohydrates to maintain brain uh, energy metabolism sufficiently. So this definition was, was once defined based on a thought process that it was important to have this many carbohydrates. We now know that's not true, but the definitions, of course, have not changed. So moderate carbohydrate was just stuck in between these two values. Now, very low carbohydrate diet is actually based on a defined phenotype. It actually results pretty reliably in the reduction of insulin below a su sufficient threshold to alter the body's fat oxidation, glucose oxidation, and ultimately increases the amount of adipose tissues that are released from your own fat and then ultimately oxidize. So it is a defined phenotype and we do see reliable metabolic changes occurring at this level of carbohydrate intake. So it is objectively changing. Where the only difference between that and a ketogenic form of that diet is the elevation of, of ketones within the circulation uh, typically at 0.5 millimolar or 0.3 millimolar or above. Um, that is when you are actually becoming, quote, keto on a ketogenic diet because ketones are actually elevated. Now, it is important to mention that ADA now actually recommends individualized carbohydrate targets and therapies as of recent. And Diabetes Canada actually um, has come out with a, a statement on many of these topics that has probably the most progressive and uh, uh, data-driven to date. Um, but this is where these definitions arose and came from. So when we talk about a low carbohydrate diet, we're really taking this old concept of food pyramid, which doesn't actually, they don't use anymore. They use a food plate, but it's this idea of looking at this, this grain carbohydrate centric diet and kind of flipping it with the foundation of having healthy forms of fat and or protein, uh, adding in fibrous carbohydrates and then ultimately fat to provide sufficient energy with on the diet and the, an ideal form is healthy, nutrient-dense uh, forms of fat, not processed forms of these foods. Obviously, whole foods are always uh, shown to be associated with better health outcomes. And of course, the absence of these starchy, sugary carbohydrates. This is how most people who have tried to implement these diets successfully are doing so, especially in the type 1 diabetes population. Mm. But this is actually not a new idea. In type 1 diabetes, uh, we've known that Early prior to the onset or the availability of insulin, we knew that patients, because there's reports out of Jocelyn Diabetes Center and some of the most premier diabetes institutes, that doctors were actually starving and or putting patients on ketogenic diets to extend their life when they were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Because actually providing glucose in the diet exaggerated uh, diabetic ketoacidosis and ultimately led to earlier deaths in many patients. So the idea was, well, what if we were to just put them on a, a protein or fat driven diet, reduce the carbohydrates in the diet and manage the amount of glucose we were seeing in the urine. And in fact, it worked. It extended the life of patients quite a bit, although not beyond a decade. Uh, most patients never lived that long because ultimately they would eventually atrophy. And the, what was happening for the patients who were extending their life was that there was almost certainly some residual beta cell function that was sufficient to allow for the storage of, of the fat and the protein that was being 
uh, simulated. Complete absence of insulin altogether is not survivable. You will ultimately result in diabetic ketoacidosis and will eventually die if your insulin is actually zero. So it was, a, it was a means to extend life in patients with my disease prior to insulin. But as you can see, as the uh, monitoring tools, insulin therapies um, came along, the emphasis on medical nutrition therapy waned over time, in fact, became a, 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 a side conversation of disinterest. The idea was if you get diagnosed with disease, you can eat whatever you want. Not everyone was saying that, of course, you need to count your carbohydrates, et cetera. But the idea was you didn't have to restrict yourself and eat differently than your peers. Um, and the emphasis on using the pharmacological and technological advancements to allow for that to happen. But suffice it to say, the earlier data I've showed you in the talk has illustrated that is in fact not working. In fact, we know the rates of things like obesity and overweight, et cetera, are just as high in prevalent in the type one diabetes population where patients with this disease used to be normal body weight. So the problems of glycemic control and or other issues like uh, obesity and uh, becoming overweight are, are, are new growing prevalent problems in the type 1 diabetes population. So um, uh, the idea of potentially using a low carbohydrate diet might have some popularity or interest in this, this group. So is it in fact popular? Well, we know that when looking at actual objective metrics of popularity in the general population, we can look at something called Google Trends. So Google has gathered data of every search ever made on its website since 2004, January 1st, 2004. And if you actually go on Google Trends and search the term diet, and I did this uh, uh, earlier this year, so it may not be exactly the same as it is now, but you find diet under the category of a nutrition, um, you find that the ketogenic diet makes up five of the top 25 terms and uh, the highest cited search topic uh, and the, associated with any specific dietary therapy. In fact, you have to get all the way to 13 before you find a different one, which is the paleolithic diet. Uh, but it's, it's quite prevalent uh, in related topics and also related queries um, when searching diet is in, in the, under the subcategory of nutrition. But what about in di uh, diabetes itself? Well, the interest in this as searched earlier this year in the last five years, just in the United States alone, that the topic of ketosis is actually the top rising term um, of interest in, in, the, in when searching diabetes as a disorder, uh, as a related topic. Uh, when researching this for the context of type one diabetes two weeks ago, uh, the ketogenic diet is in fact, number one in rising terms for type one diabetes in the United States for the past five years. So uh, uh, even as of two weeks ago, at least for the context of type one diabetes, interest clearly for the patients, caregivers, and people treating these diseases, uh, people with this disease is high and is still very, very high. But we also know there's a number of increased citations in ketogenic diets, low carbohydrate diets. Uh, they have not slowed down. They get higher and higher every single year. So this is scientific interest as well. But we know there's cited patient interest and a number of published books that have come out, some of which have been around for over a decade, but many are very new and just came out. In fact, uh, all but the Bernstein's Diabetes Solution book are all new um, and, and available for uh, patients with my disease to, to read and consider when thinking about a ketogenic diet and type 1 diabetes. Although I wouldn't necessarily recommend them all, um, but they are available. So what does the data actually say for low carbohydrate diets and, and type, uh, or in diabetes in general? Well, in type two diabetes, uh, we know there's a number of uh, meta-analysis and, and systemic reviews that have been put out there, all of which are, are some of the most higher profile ones are here. Although there's been even more subsequent to that about diabetes remission out of um, BMJ that I don't even cite here with a link at the bottom to well over 70 published trials. I and mean, there's probably over hundred at this point looking at this. And actually some of the attendees on this talk that I saw uh, have actually contributed to some of these um, looking at very low carbohydrate uh, and very low calorie based diets for type two diabetes and the ability to potentially induce remission of type two diabetes. So we know that they are a very effective tool and largely what we'd expect to see with these two dietary interventions on categories of obesity, glycemia, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, inflammation, hypertension. Uh, there's a number of cited, commonly cited benefits that we see on these diets. Although the one thing that we expect oftentimes is for the increase in LDL particle number which is a concern for um, those in the cardiovascular and cardiology community uh, in, in actually treating that, although there are ways to potentially uh, regulate and manage that on a diet like this.
All right, what about the disease I'm most interested in? Uh, obviously a personal bias here with my own diagnosis. A type one diabetes, what does the data say in very low carbohydrates and, and ketogenic diets and type one diabetes? Well, we had originally looked at 17 publications and now we've extended this to 80, uh, we extended this search. So I'm showing you just some of these results of the prior search, not the most up-to-date um, data. Uh, the most up-to-date data now includes 89 publications and, and over 40,000 type one diabetic subjects. Well, this is a glimpse of what we saw in the original search of the 17 publications that we found the very low carbohydrate uh, group. Uh, we looked at various biomarkers, including HbA1c, because its association with multiple uh, outcomes in type 1 diabetes, acute and chronic, is it linked to mechanism action for linking to uh, adverse outcomes long term? Trials that are confirm it, like DCC and addict to microvascular disease and beyond. Uh, I won't belabor the points. You guys can see this here, and I believe this talk is recorded, so you can go back and look. But we looked at insulin load, uh, the medication to treat this disease, and also the most potent hypoglycemic agent. We looked at lipids, the concern of, uh, of cardiovascular risk in this, this disease intervention, or this is treatment intervention in this disease. What about continuous glucose uh, control? And also um, risk for severe adverse outcomes in the form of uh, hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia. Well, here is a summary of what uh, these very low carbohydrate diets actually showed across the literature in all 17 of those trials. A robust reduction in HbA1c, in fact, 16 out of 18 of the cohorts in those published studies uh, had a non-diabetic HbA1c. I, I cannot emphasize enough how important that is. There is currently no other intervention available to a type 1 diabetic besides the ones that require experimental exploratory uh, transplant therapy that allows for a patient to readily achieve non-diabetic HbA1c. So essentially go into the doctor, get in your blood work, and your glycemic values come back saying you don't have this disease anymore, uh, and, except for when you start eating carbohydrates and see that it's not quickly coming down, you know you have the disease. But in essence, they're controlling HbA1c just like you would it'd hope in a normal non-diabetic range uh, in, in at least 16 out of the 18 cohorts, that is. Insulin, insulin load came down both absolute and relative to body weight. And we saw the range of insulin reductions anywhere from 33 to 60%. So the medication required for this disease and also the most potent hyperglycemic agent to manage this disease uh, were reduced quite dramatically. We did see reductions in triglycerides. We saw reductions in total cholesterol, but Interestingly, even though it was a very low carbohydrate diet, one would expect LDL to go up. It's a very common theme when looking at low carbohydrate diets, what you'd expect to have happen because uh, uh, usually because of the elevation and saturated fat in the diet, which has been linked to uh, higher levels of LDL. But we actually don't see that. There's a mix of studies that show a decrease, no change and increase of, of LDL in these studies. And we do see an elevation in HDL. So some of this actually goes against what we'd expect. We'd expect total cholesterol and LDL to go up based on prior literature, but that's not actually what we're seeing here when we look at type one diabetes in, the, in these studies. Uh, when actually looking at continuous glucose monitoring, so this is really a way of looking into the, the real day-to-day -day life of the patient. What is actually happening on a regular basis? And like, what is our actual glucose levels every day? How much is it going up? How much is it coming down? Because I can tell you, that up and down for a patient with my disease is, it feels like a roller coaster. You feel it, you know, when your blood sugar is high, you know, when it's low and you know, when it's swinging up and down because you feel anything but normal, even though most patients live their entire life in abnormal as illustrated by this graph uh, above it. But we see that patients with this disease actually inter using the, uh, across the published studies using a very low carbohydrate diet in type one diabetes, the mean blood glucose is actually almost one for one similar to the non-diabetic population, healthy non-diabetic population. And this is 105.8, whereas the uh, mean blood glucose in the non-diabetic population using these same devices is right at 100. The standard deviation is dramatically lower, double, double smaller than the average type one diabetic deviation, although still higher than the non-diabetic cohort. Improvements in the amount of time spent in normal range, um, it is important to mention, though, that there was a slightly increase in hypoglycemia um, when using this diet. And, and I can probably attest that this is most likely because patients, when they start achieving more normalized glucose levels, they start dropping their mean blood glucose proportionally, even though sometimes their low end here is getting them into hypo 
they feel safer because the swings are much smaller. So they, they tend to, to, to tread that a little more, even though they don't have to, although many do. But we do know that looking at the data right now on especially the larger observational analysis using this, data, uh, this uh, intervention, that the amount of severe adverse events in the form of hyperglycemia, i.e. DKA, or hypoglycemia, i.e. a coma, seizure, or death, are actually infinitely lower. Um, so even though you might see, you know, 4% hypos versus 2% hypos with this intervention, the amount of severe adverse events is what we're really worried about here is actually much lower than historical averages in the type 1 diabetic population. So when we talk about this, what we're talking about is the only therapeutic strategy currently right now in type 1 diabetes, which has repeatedly demonstrated the ability to normalize HbA1c and have a number of other benefits in reducing well-known risk biomarkers and ultimately quality of life biomarkers in patients with my disease. But there are concerns and criticisms of this dietary intervention. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Uh, all right, uh, I think I got about 10 minutes here. You're, you're uh, doing fine, you're doing fine. Good deal, all right. So when we talk about interventions like this, especially very low carbohydrate ketogenic diets, there are a number of criticisms that have been brought up to me over the years as I've spoken about this, particularly at diabetes clinics from endocrinologists, especially pediatric endocrinologists concerned about a number of these potential consequences or clinical concerns, things like uh, if you do a low carbohydrate diet and you produce more ketones, won't you be at risk for ketoacidosis, higher risk? Well, uh, what if I eat less carbohydrates in my diet? Won't I have lower blood sugars and ultimately have higher risk for hypoglycemia? What if I am a, a patient, I've seen data in seizure patients that has used this diet as a, as a, uh, therapy to manage seizures, but also and sometimes cure seizures in patients with neurological disorders, um, there has been some cited literature that a small percentage of those patients actually have impaired growth. Well, that also happened to those in type 1 diabetes. What about cardiovascular disease? If I dramatically increase the amount of fat in the diet, uh, am I not increasing my risk for cardiovascular disease uh, as a cited based on literature 20 years back that says that high fat diets are not good for your health? Uh, what about kidney function? If you have a diet that sometimes can lead to higher protein intake, won't that hurt my kidneys? Uh, some will say that all diets, and there's enough literature to support this, that all diets have compliance issues uh, when trying to help guide a patient on their journey. But what about quality of life? You know, if I can't eat, you know, the birthday cake at my friend's party, will my quality of life be diminished? If I can't eat 60% of the grocery store when I walk in it, will I have the same quality of life that I would have otherwise? So this is a quick snapshot of what these are. On the left-hand side are all the concerns I just spoke about. Because this data is so new uh, in this area with 17 published um, studies, now that seems like a lot, but what we don't have is long-term randomized controlled trials using this intervention, the gold standard of what people expect to see when giving clinically-based decisions. So, what do we look at if we don't have outcome data for all these biomarkers? We do have some outcome data on ketoacidosis and hypoglycemia and quality of life, but the rest we don't. Well, what do you look at? You have to look at risk factors for the adverse outcomes. So when actually considering risk factors for ketoacidosis, hypoglycemia, pediatric growth, cardiovascular disease, and beyond, a lot of these are linked to poor glycemic control. And we know that this dietary intervention can dramatically improve glycemic control. Some unique examples is in the, in, in the case of uh, things like cardiovascular disease. So cardiovascular disease, there was actually a published study using the largest, most robust data, not the largest data set, but the most robust data set in type 1 diabetes, which is uh, over a thousand subjects studied over a 30 year period of time who had type 1 diabetes using, um, looking at increased insulin utilization and its impact on glycemic control. And then ultimately, uh, micro and microvascular complications. And when they looked at that data set in 2016, so almost 30 years since the onset of that trial, they looked at what were the risk factors associated with cardiovascular disease. And what they found in bold there were the significant actual uh, risk factors, things like glycemic control and HbA1c, triglycerides in the form of lipids, and then ultimately insulin load. So as HbA1c got higher, cardiovascular disease risk went up. 
As triglycerides got higher, cardiovascular disease went up. As insulin load got higher, cardiovascular disease went up. But what was interesting is that weight, total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL, things historically shown to be associated with cardiovascular disease in the general population or in diseases like obesity, um, were right at around one hazard ratio. Now, if people aren't familiar with hazard ratios, hazard ratio is the fold change elevated risk that someone would have for uh, accruing a disease. If you have one fold risk, you have no elevation of risk. If you have a two fold risk or a two fold hazard ratio, you have two times the risk of developing that disease in this, in, in any particular circumstance. In this case, weight, total cholesterol, and LDL and HDL had about a one fold risk, meaning there was no elevated meaningful change in risk in these biomarkers when they were compared to other biomarkers like HbA1c, triglycerides, and insulin load. Hence, where we should focus on when we think about managing risk biomarkers in cardiovascular disease. Now, kidney dysfunction, HbA1c has been linked to kidney dysfunction. Obviously, uh, it's a microvascular disease that destroy the, destroys the kidneys. Um, but the concern about protein intake is not actually evidence-based. Uh, we know that protein intake matters when you are on the progressive uh, kidney failure uh, side of the equation where you can't even process nitrogen that comes downstream of metabolized protein. But we know that uh, in the context of no kidney disease, that elevated protein intake has no adverse effects on kidney health. At least the most robust data to date says that. Uh, compliance, we know... Oh. When we talk about compliance, we know that uh, any form of dietary change or restriction, honestly, if you've got a patient th to do exercise, to do anything to improve their lifestyle and improve their health, there's going to be a lot of patients who have difficulty with that transition. And it has nothing to do with this particular dietary strategy. In fact, all the evidence I've seen in the most robust randomized clinical trials to date says that the compliance of this diet is no different than any other diet. Uh, and then quality of life, we know it's a complicated multifactorial thing. But we do know that HbA1c, as it goes higher, quality of life goes lower. And we know the accrual of acute and chronic complications re results in lower quality of life. And in this specific situation, we do know that increased self-reported quality of life has occurred with very low carbohydrate diets and type 1 diabetes. Uh, but the da data is a little biased because it was, it's observational and not randomized or controlled um, when it's observed. But it's worth noting because that's the evidence we have. So when we talk about a very low carbohydrate diet in the context of type 1 diabetes, most people often find themselves talking about these hypothetical concerns that sit above the surface that people think about. Things like hypoglycemia, pediatric growth, adherence, LDL cholesterol, ketoacidosis, and quality of life. Even though only two of those actually have some legitimate evidence that it may be going up uh, in these scenarios, although LDL might be questionable based on the evidence specific to type 1 diabetes. But under the surface, what most people are not talking about or even appreciating until they get and look beyond what they, they first see is the reported benefits of this dietary strategy like triglycerides, H, HbA1c, insulin load, uh, glycemic stability, quality of life, and the, the reduction in incidence of severe adverse events compared to reported averages in type 1 diabetes not using this diet. And this ultimately leads to the question of what about the potential for it to reduce severe disease that comes subsequent to the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes as well. And so I, I like to just show this graphic to illustrate that when we talk about disease management, we're not talking about one problem. We're talking about a host of considerations and problems that the patient has to consider and encounter on a regular basis, especially with this disease, that is certainly the case. And you can't consider just one biomarker and hinge your entire diagnosis and treatment, uh, not diagnosis, but the treatment and management of the disease based on that. You have to consider the totality of what other intervention you're giving the patient and how it might or may not benefit that patient. And here is just an illustration of the things that have to be brought into consideration in the totality of this specific intervention, as it has been shown to be one of the most remarkable and improving the primary biomarker outcome linked to long-term outcomes in type 1 diabetes glycemic control. So there's also uh, some appreciation of positive anecdotes, and I'll kind of quickly go through these here. This is a friend of mine uh, who gave me, he's actually talked about this publicly and gave me this slide to share. Uh, his uh, son's name is, uh, well, I won't get his son's name, um, but his, his father's name is Lester Hightower. His son, when he was diagnosed at 10.6 HbA1c, uh, a little bit after starting to manage the disease, came down to 7.6, which is 
uh, actually a little bit better than most patients would experience, but um, usually patients stay at or higher than that uh, for the duration of their disease. We actually see that his son at every single appointment since his uh, onset of the very low carbohydrate diet was a normal HbA1c over the years. And his son is actually now taller than his father and going on to college next year. So an incredible success story who is a, a pediatric uh, patient and the link to that, his dad talking about his story uh, is below. This actual story came from an article from a uh, Duke and Harvard published study that actually showed a low carbohydrate diet from an observational study from a community I'm a part of, uh, had the most remarkable glycemic control outcomes ever reported in a, uh, a given intervention type 1 diabetes and it happened to be a very low carbohydrate diet. And uh, it was the most shared article in 2018 when it was published in the New York Times. So it got a lot of interest. The type 1 diabetes community is a, a quite a big advocacy community. And this is his father speaking about it because his son was actually featured in that New York Times article. I myself have done this diet and I have been type 1 diabetic for over 15 years. Um, the reason I'm passionate about this topic, not only from the research perspective, but also my personal life experience. I switched to a very low carbohydrate diet and adjusted my insulin some time ago, which meant taking out the things like potatoes and, and fruit from my diet and replacing it with uh, healthy, uh, nutrient-dense fat sources. Ultimately, that resulted in a pretty robust reduction in the amount of insulin I was taking by uh, over 70%. Um, at one point, it was, over, it, was, it was quite a bit more than that, but it, was, it went from about 90 to 100 units per day to about 20 to 30 units per day when switching on this diet. Uh, the equated cost of that, if I didn't have health insurance, was about $900 per month, about $175 per month. So a huge cost saving, uh, not only to the patient, but obviously to the uh, uh, health like well, health insurance companies and beyond. The total global health impact uh, is, is quite a bit here. Um, and this isn't uncommon to hear of these level reduction, as I showed you in the cited data, about a 33 to 60% reduction is what's been reported thus far. And this is my CGM on the left hand side prior to switching onto this diet. And this is after an example of after switching onto this diet. Uh, this is not uncommon and, and actually quite normal for me to see a much, much dramatically improved glycemic control. And this is really where an illustration to me of quality of life. Uh, and this is just a 60 day average of that, uh, showing that I'm sitting right between the 70 and uh, 120 range. This was a graph taken and in, in, in from a uh, prior presentation I gave, but uh, I can uh, pull up a graph from uh, essentially today in the last two weeks, and it, it looks very similar to this. Um, I have, uh, with a typical HbA1c being much higher in, in the diabetic range at 6.5 or above, and pre diabetic is 5.7 and above, I have seen numbers as low as a 4.9 before on this diet to intervention. And I have to say, I'm damn proud of that because it's a dramatically different quality of life when living with this disease, having a level of glycemic control like that. Um, and there's now hundreds of thousands of pediatric adult patients with type 1 diabetes. This is a snapshot from a community of parents who wanted to share their kid's story and gave consent to do so here uh, for a presentation like this out of a group called Type 1 Grit. Uh, these are examples of kids who are doing these interventions, a lot of them holding their meters and their HbA1c values uh, and signs of success, doing various things to live a normal life, uh, just like their non-diabetic peers. Um, and these are just more pictures to share of, of those kids who shared their story. And now when we talk about, so this is the uh, last slide or two, when we talk about this from a healthcare provider perspective, there's huge increase in popularity. Uh, but on, of concern and of note, is the self-reported implementation of these diets in the absence or very little uh, input from healthcare providers. Uh, and this has been cited because of the hesitancy of patients to share their dietary choice with providers because of the hypothesized backlash they may receive because of a lot of healthcare providers view this diet negatively. Um, and ultimately, it's critical that healthcare providers understand and appreciate this potential tool and the toolkit to help guide patients because patients doing this in the absence of healthcare uh, oversight ultimately uh, seems like a recipe for disaster. At least it could be better, clearly with healthcare support and more people in the, in the, uh, the, the court of this patient to help them uh, manage this disease better. Um, when talking about this from a clinical perspective, is there eligibility and ineligibility criteria for this population? Well, 
uh, eligibility for this is certainly type one diabetes, but there really isn't a whole lot of ineligibility criteria currently cited, although there's clearly that inability to metabolize fat, you would not be able to deal with this or end stage liver failure is currently a contraindication for using this diet. Uh, there may be some others that I have failed to mention here, but for the most part, it's, it's not uh, something um, that has a clear contraindication unless you have a clear in, uh, metabolic disease beyond type one of these, the inability to produce or process some of these fats. Um, and there are things to consider. Uh, I gave a talk for uh, something called the Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition. It's, it's a very innovative institute that is uh, trying to bring about um, a, a lot of information and, and guidance on these topics uh, from an institutional perspective. And I go into much more details on these topics, such as how to overcome predictable and preventable poor diet formulation problems. Uh, the inability, oftentimes patients or caregivers or a clinicians will put people on these diets without actually adapting insulin, which is a big no-no. You have to know to change that. Hypoglycemia, patients allowing themselves to get too low on this therapy without actually earning it, meaning you have to get your standard deviation low enough to where you can drop your mean with it. Uh, dropping the mean before the standard deviation uh, is small enough, ultimately it's going to lead to more hypos. And uh, the inability to know or anticipate medication adjustments. If patients are on other hypoglycemic agents or glucose lowering agents, we know this dietary intervention can often cause a deep prescription or a lowering of medications um, along the way. So that has to be anticipated and accounted for. And in fact, maybe proactively prevented up front. And a lot of people are not prepared for the metabolic adaptation. When your body goes to the adaptation from being almost predominantly uh, glucose burning to, to fat burning, there is some uh, changes in mineral load, um, some fatigue that may accompany the shift in mineral load, et cetera, that can be overcome by uh, adjusting for those things. So I'm not going to go into grave detail there. It could be its own separate talk, but it, uh, there is a talk from IPTN I gave that um, discusses these in more detail for clinicians interested in those topics. So in summary, uh, there's increased interest of this dietary strategy, both globally and within the type 1 diabetic uh, uh, populations for a whole host of reasons. And the data suggests right now, this intervention in this disease specifically improves HbA1c, lowers insulin load and medication requirements, and improves glycemic control, um, and ultimately lipids and severe adverse events uh, appear to either not change or actually improve. Considerations for common pitfalls uh, in this when you're a healthcare provider guiding a patient are obvious and should be considered. Um, if not, they are going to potentially arise and they are clearly predictable. So it, it should be considered and prevented. And then healthcare team plays a critical role ultimately in guiding the patients on this journey. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it's important to, to make sure you feel involved. But I wanna, I wanna add something here. At the very end is the last thing I'll say is when we talk about where are we at now, and what could ultimately lead to a better future or advance the future of this disease, there, there's two key things I wanna bring up here. One is that there is not a randomized control tile greater than seven days utilizing a very low carbohydrate diet in type one diabetes. Until that happens, uh, most physicians or governing bodies won't pay attention to the data that is currently available, even though we have 17 studies that say the results I have described here today. They will wait and or prevent the utilization of this therapy until this RCT or an RCT greater than seven days actually comes. I could have a whole different talk about that, but suffice it to say, obviously this should happen. Obviously it is needed and it gives greater uh, comfort to a physician guiding a patient on this journey or physician, healthcare provider, uh, anyone who's in the healthcare team. So ultimately this is funding dependent and to my knowledge uh, has not been funded to date. Uh, and we're working to actually get that off the ground. So if you know of anyone who actually wants to philanthropically uh, participate in getting this off the ground, uh, please reach out and let me know. And the next thing here is clinical guidelines, ultimately for, for the very low carbohydrate and type one diabetes. There's been initiatives by the Institute for Personalized Therapy and Nutrition to actually bring these to the forefront. We know this is the most popular diet in type one diabetes right now. We know that patients are often doing this without healthcare support. And it's not necessarily because healthcare supporters um, don't want to help their patients. All of them want to help their patients is the lack of ability to understand how to do that appropriately is ultimately a barrier that we're hoping to overcome, uh, on all sides of the equation, both patient and the provider. And for that, uh, here's a resource slide. I have a website that's free and available for anyone to gives a much more robust discussion on this topic with cited literature. If you want to go back and 
uh, uh, look at any of these topics, patients related to it and other resources as well. So uh, with that, I appreciate you guys and I'll stop sharing the slides here and uh, take any questions. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Where, where to begin? Uh, uh, we have a, a number of questions in the chat. Um, usually I like to start with those. Okay. Um, what if, this is from Dr. Harwood, Harvitz. What about the argument that blood ketones are high, but perhaps not being utilized? I've seen people who start a keto diet and have higher ketones early on and then less thereafter. Perhaps the ketones are better utilized the, the longer one is on keto. Uh, Dr. Horvitz is Horvitz. nailed it. Yeah, so that's actually true. So we do know that when patients first go on this diet, they can see uh, elevations in ketone bodies, which is normal, although it's usually <laughs> sustained, but we also usually seeing a spilling of it into the urine as well. And the spilling of it into the urine, it, it, it usually decreases over time. Is an illustration, there's an increased uptake and utilization of these molecules. We've also done out of our lab, chronic feeding studies of these uh, of exogenous ketones over time. So not necessarily doing the diet, but actually directly feeding ketones. And we know that at, over time, the kinetics of these exogenous ketone administration change over time and shrink, meaning that the kinetics in the body of these molecules illustrate that over time, as you feed more, that your body starts to be able to metabolize them more readily. So, um, so yes, the answer to that is yes, that is happening. It is the case. You can actually metabolize them. So if ketones are present, some of them will spill out into the urine, but uh, we know that a lot of that is actually being metabolized. And then uh, of preference, two of the sites in the body that are higher, highest utilizer of ketone bodies are actually the brain and the heart. These, these, both these tissues appear to preferentially want to use ketone bodies based on the current evidence we have over other metabolites. So we know, especially the heart, that's a big hog, energy hog of ketones. Now the muscle mass itself from a peripheral tissue, skeletal muscle mass, because it is so large, also uses a lot of it when it's readily available. Uh, but generally speaking, per gram of tissue, the brain and heart are actually the biggest utilizers. Great. Um, I think the next question you actually answered, what have you been able to get your hemoglobin A1C down to using the ketogenic diet? I think you... You, uh, you you answered that one, right? Yeah. So um, I, 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 did, I will say that there's, the spread of that has always been uh, less than six. There's only been one scenario where I was ever above six. Uh, and it was when I was not on this diet, trying something called a flexible dieting approach, which is kind of a uh, eat based on the macronutrients in the diet and not necessarily on the food or consistency. And so, um, but for the vast majority of my life, yes. And that 4.9 is, is the lowest I've gotten. How long should someone be on a very low uh, carbohydrate diet? So I will say and say that that is up to the individual, right? So if the individual goes on this diet, you know, it isn't something that necessarily everyone has to do right now or else, right? This is the individualized thing. There's cultural considerations. There's social economic considerations for the patient. So everyone has to consider their own life, their consideration for going on a diet like this. What usually ends up happening with someone who considers a diet like this is they have tried everything that is out there to improve their situation. And they're just, they keep dealing with hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia on a regular basis, which is what most patients experience. And so they're like, well, there's gotta be a solution out there. And what they do is they eventually come across this intervention, try it. If they're effective with it, I have not seen a patient turn around and go the other way. And once you get normal glycemic control, it's very hard to unlearn what normal now feels like. And so once you get there, I, I've never seen a person go back. But um, it, the thing is, is how long can someone go on it? It's up to them. I have chosen to be on this diet for 15 years. Now, would I be on this diet for 15 years if I was not a type one diabetic? And this is really the only meaningful therapeutic solution to normalize my glucose control and, and kind of ensure I'm risk and improving my biomarkers. I can't say I, I can't say that with confidence that I would, even though there's health benefits associated with it. I, without this disease, I, I might say, I, I don't know if I would give up getting to snack on some of the best tasting foods in the entire world, uh, which are uh, other forms of carbohydrates. But I feel lucky in some ways that I stick with this, I, that I have this disease and that this is a therapeutic solution because it prevents me from eating a lot of the foods that I probably shouldn't be touching on a regular basis to ultimately optimize my health. So um, that's a long-winded way to squirrely answer that question. But in essence, up to the patient, and there have been patients who've done this for 60 plus years. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I figured that that was the answer. Um, a, a couple of uh, we'll get back to a couple of questions here, but what about uh, like gluten uh, issues? Do you, do you deal with that at all? So I don't have issues personally with this, but I also don't eat a bunch of carbs to know. So <laughs> there's that. Uh, but there's there's it's common for type one diabetes to also experience other autoimmune issues. So celiac disease is actually hi much higher in the type one diabetic population than it is in the non-type one diabetic population. So type one diabetics in general might be more susceptible to issues related to things like wheat consumption, et cetera, that ultimately can perpetuate celiac disease um, at a higher rate than the non-diabetic population would. Um, but that's how, that's my familiarity with celiac disease in the context of type one diabetes, higher rate. And obviously you'd have to consume carbohydrates to get that. You would remove both those problems on an intervention like this. How about a couple of the other sort of, uh, sister low carbohydrates, FODMAPs for one would be mm -hmm. one, right? And, uh, um, I know there's another one, but any, any, any yeah. of those, uh, lectins is another, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of buzzword. And, and any of those that you you avoid also, or uh, so I'm I'm familiar with lectins. Can't speak to it because I don't have enough knowledge on the on the topic to really go in depth with it. But I'm familiar with some of the elimination diets, FODMAP diets, uh, Whole Thirty diets, things like that. Um, I honestly, my my take is I'm just giving you a, a personal opinion on that, uh, and not really as much of a research based opinion because there's a ton of research on low carb. There's a ton of research on uh. uh FODMAP, whole food, or whole 30 diets, stuff like restrictive diets, autoimmune diets. My take is that ultimately everyone probably could benefit from doing some form of elimination and finding out what actually suits them well on a regular basis. You know, a clinician may hear that and their head might explode and say, well, yeah, are you really recommending that every patient eliminate things from their diet? That's unrealistic. I'm not talking about what's realistic or not. I'm just saying from an optimized health perspective, would it be good if everyone like started from ground zero to actually find out what their body actually does well with over time. So in essence, the only way to do that in today's society is to restrict and build from that restriction out to find out what your body responds well to. So from that perspective, I'm actually, I'm actually trying that right now. Uh, so I actually tried something called a whole 30 diet on uh, which I'm doing low carb, but what whole 30 means, I don't entirely know. My wife's the one who convinced me to do it, to be honest with you. So I'm just kind of doing it with her. Um, but in essence, you're removing any artificial sweeteners and any non whole foods from the diet. And I will say that I have found that uh, there's a few things I eliminated that I was experiencing maybe not ideal, uh, symptoms, or I'd be chronically hungry because I added too much stevia into some, something that I consumed. So I was, I had that enhanced palatability and I dealt with that hunger more than I needed to for the rest of the day. So, you know, I've played around with this person a little bit. I'm a little bit less familiar um, on the literature as a whole, uh, and how it relates to this specific diet, other than a low carb diet is a form of an elimination diet in some ways. Um, so what about food sensitivity tests? Are you familiar with any of them at all? Or, you know, they'll yeah, take I am. Blood or, or, you know, and they'll tell you you're sensitive to cashews, but not almonds or, you know, uh, yeah, I, I am familiar with them. Um, I am familiar with them. I cannot speak to, uh, their utilization or not in this topic, to be honest with you. Do they or do they not have use? I don't even know. Um, uh, I, but I'm sure there are people who do know more about the topic than me. Okay. Um, question about, uh, so semi-glutide is, is a, uh, you know, fairly pretty yeah. popular even in the non-diabetic world because there, there's a, 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 it's a potent weight loss. Um, right. Uh, 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 substance. And the question is, um, is that, is that you're able to use semi-glutide with di diabetes type one? And you know, that's a good question. I'm sure people have off label to use it. There is one study in type one diabetes to my knowledge on semi-glutides use. Um, I expect every population that has overweight issues to probably be touching that drug because of its immense efficacy shown in the journal of medicine paper. So, um, the ability to, to suppress appetite seems incredibly powerful for uh, many of the issues we deal with in our obesogenic society, you know, um, with the, the hyper palatable foods and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I suspect we'll see a lot more research in, and in particular other diseases beyond just type two diabetes and obesity where it originally was shown. So I seem to remember somewhere that, that you, the, the incretins, you know, that's one of them. Um, you're not supposed to uh, use them with insulin though. Is that, is that the... Uh... <sighs> I, well, I'll tell you this, I do know there are plenty of physicians who are uh, 
giving the whole house the shotgun approach of getting patient, whatever it takes to get the patients to improve. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, my take, well, through my experience, I it didn't seem to hold back some physicians from doing any a multitude of therapies to improve outcomes, but I can't really speak to that from a clinical perspective and what a, a clinician might be or not doing on that. So mm -hmm. can type one uh, develop in uh, adulthood? Yes. In fact, uh, the data from that 2022 September paper says that the mean age of diagnosis is now in the 30s for type 1 diabetes. This was once a pediatric disease, a childhood disease that was expected to only be happening in childhood. But we now can appreciate that actually a large number of adults are being diagnosed. And it's probably for two reasons. One's probably legit, like for increase of diagnosis for reasons that are probably environmental that we don't fully understand yet. But the second reason is almost certainly because of a, a increased awareness that a lot of type twos were actually type ones. Um, and now we have advanced tools to actually be able to capture that. Um, things like antibody testing and, and other tools that allow us to refine that it isn't type two, it's type one, it's just much slower progressing, i.e. called LADA, uh, late adult, uh, forget the exact definition, late autoimmune diabetes. Uh, either way, LADA is the term used, LADA, for adult induced, uh, late onset adult type one diabetes. Okay. Could you elaborate just a little bit on the antibodies and, and uh yeah, so not all type 1 diabetic uh, forms of type 1 diabetes actually have positive antibody testing. But uh, if you do have positive antibody testing, usually it's more than one, uh, your risk for developing disease goes up infinitely. And all, all this is, is looking at as autoantibodies for um, detection of autoimmunity against uh, beta cells. And ultimately, if you have one, uh, your risk is much higher. You have two, and Joe may know a bit more about this than I do. He sits in a lot of talks on this. But ultimately, if you have a multitude of these antibodies present, your increased risk for this disease can almost be upwards of 99% uh, for getting diagnosed. Uh, so but this just comes down to the autoimmunity factor of this, right? So uh, once you find out your body is auto having auto reactivity to um, uh, your beta cells, you know you're on a likely spiral to get diagnosed, but not all type ones have autoantibodies and they still have type one. Mm -hmm. So it isn't universal, um, but it is. What, what uh, is the percentage? Of distribution between autoantibody positive and autoantibody Yeah, negative. positive uh, antibodies with type one. What's the percentage? I actually don't know that number. That's a good question. Okay. Right, well, right, I, have, right. I have a thing here that I want to talk about. Um, if I have <laughs> Dr. Um, uh, William Malomi. Um, but um, I mean, your presentation was great. I like the low carb. Is it zero carb or do you have some carb there in your diet? Yeah, so I, uh, as most people would recommend on this dietary strategy that the carbohydrates should be coming from fibrous green carbohydrates in the form of like spinach, broccoli, et cetera to get important phytonutrients and fiber in the diet. Obviously, fiber is an important uh, component of health in gut health as well. And there's a number of phytonutrients within uh, vegetables in general that are important that you don't want to, well, at least I would not want to universally avoid. Uh, there are some people who do diets that are completely absent of all carbohydrates, but that's not what most people would even uh, recommend. That's more of on the, uh, that is a much more controversial topic, I guess is a nice way to say it. It's just hard to get zero zero carbohydrate from from natural <laughs> diet because especially if you want to eat vegetables, there is some carbohydrate in it, and you need the nutrition yeah. and the vitamins and polyphenols in it. Now, <clears throat> the thing is that I want to add, and I think you are diabetic type one. Yep. And recently, me and my group, and I think Dr. William, uh, were discussing um, oxytocin, and it has an anti-diabetic effect, a very powerful mm -hmm. anti-diabetic effect. To the point, I have some doctors <clears throat> reporting that the patients was on, um, they have 400 uh, glucose and they end up into 80 with, with, uh, with oxytocin. And um, I want more data, just one patient is not enough. And before they have been done intranasal oxytocin, but I think in those it's not right. Um, I think now we can go up to 100 international units and it's just in a state of just going 40, especially with patients who have conditions like yourself with diabetic type one. So as a patient, Oh, as a doctor, can you help us in getting reports with our data out of using intranasal oxytocin up to 100 international 
unit because it does help to stimulate insulin from the beta cells if there's anything left and also increase the sensitivity of insulin. Plus it helps to um, um, induce um, fat shrinking or uh, lipolysis plus regeneration of the muscles. So, and it helps to change the body composition with that kind of high concentration uh, of oxytocin. Maybe this something with your diet, and possibly this will knock down even your insulin dosage into half and maybe zero, I don't know. Um, and also it will help also the puffy eye that you have there in your arms, your eyes, if you use internasal oxytocin, um, because it does have some uh, neurovascular modulation effect as well. And it has an anti-aging effect. And so it has that collagen building and helps the skin rejuvenation. Um, so is that something you may consider? And I'll connect you with a compounding pharmacy and try it for three months and then report us your um, insulin dosage and your wellness in general and um, how you feel about using it. And then that will help us to get more data uh, to prove oxytocin intranasal along with your diet. It's, it's a powerful tool to manage patients with uh, diabetes type one. All right, so a lot of things are unpacked there. Uh, I don't know if these bags are going away. Those are totally genetic, uh, but they may. And if oxytocin cures that, holy shit, you got something way more powerful than a, a body recomposition agent for many people. So that might be something interesting. I actually studied oxytocin intranasal uh, when I was at the Department of Defense grant from the Ox Office of Navy Research. We actually were studying intranasal use of oxytocin for uh, thermal regulation capacity. One of the world experts on that is Natalie Ebler at the University of Florida. Uh, and uh, I've actually since walked away from that project, but it's still being ongoing right now. Um, if you got access to that, I wouldn't mind trying it. Um, now, the, the thing that I'm familiar with with oxytocin intranasally is it wasn't as potent as, uh, if you actually look at the blood kinetics of intranasal oxytocin, it's uh, questionable. It's it, it, meaning like the ability to actually readily elevate uh, oxytocin to meaningful levels with a singular dose is and yeah, for we're very not long. doing singular dose and we're also enhancing it with photodynamic therapy as well. So there's a lot of other things we add. So instead of just using 40 international unit, you go up to 100 international unit. Plus if you have still barrier of getting it through the blood brain barrier or through the blood, then you can use uh, intranasal photodynamic therapy, which helps to um, increase the blood brain barrier. Plus it does help to increase the blood flow and, and absorption of oxytocin because it's only nine amino acids. It's not a big deal for oxytocin not to pass through uh, and getting into the blood. And, and then we are also uh, advocating doing subcutaneous oxytocin as well. So this is something and, you know, we can also you know, help you to we'll supply you with that as well. But let's start with intranasal oxytocin, see what would happen. And then if you see some good results or enhancement or improvement, then we may consider also adding oxytocin uh, subcutaneous so you can have both uh, the peripheral effect of oxytocin plus the central one. I'd be interested for sure. And I, from a, especially because I, I am familiar with this topic, I am not diabetes specific, it was more for thermal regulatory perspective, but because of that, uh, I am familiar with the, the intranasal use. Have you ever connected with uh, Natalie Ebner or any other people working? Well, if you connect us with all those people, we are interested um, in anybody who is interested in advancing it, anybody who's already working on it. Uh, we want to learn from all those doctors and get them here with Dr. William Bill presenting to us. That would be fine. I'll be presenting here as well. So um, I own the 22. I'll, I, I just okay. prepare the whole pack here even more illustration and everything is coming out recently. That's the reason, you know, we don't hear much of oxytocin because the publications yeah. is 2017 and 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Um, but me and the compounding pharmacy, we're trying to enhance the absorption of intranasal using photodynamic therapy. So that's one way of getting hmm. better okay. results. Yeah. So, but I invite anybody that you think here and I'll be presenting it on the 22 and with Dr. Billy William, Okay. But if you have those doctors, you can invite them on 22 here. Uh, that would okay. be great. Is that okay, Dr. William? Fine with me. More the merrier. Okay. You know, I always ask, bring one person. So um, uh, another question. Um, are you familiar with the glycomark blood test? And if so, have you seen any falsely low levels in people on, keto, on the keto uh, plans? I'm curious what the glycomark uh, uh, refer to i'm not familiar with that is it a glucagon test is it a c peptide uh, test i'm or not is really it... sure dr horvis asked are you still with us Let me see if I can pull yeah up. i'm here 
What does that refer to? Steve. Glycomar Glycomark is a test. I get it through LabCorp. Uh, supposedly, it looks for glucose excursions above 180. Hmm. And if you're glycomark, they have levels uh, below 10. They say you're in poor diabetic control. Above 10, you're in good diabetic control. But I bring this up only because I've been seeing in diabetics who are uncontrolled, it's absolutely below 10. But I'm also seeing in people who have been keto for quite a while that it's below 10. Hmm. And I've asked glycomark a couple times to, as to why are they seeing this as well, and they're not. So it's G L Y C O Mark M A R K. Uh, if you're okay. not familiar. All right, I'll check that out. I am unfamiliar. It would be interesting to know why. There are certainly a whole host of metabolic shifts that happen on this diet. So um, if there's any type of metabolically oriented uh, biomarker, then I could see there being an interaction. Yeah, I was just wondering whether possibly ketones interact with it in some way, but uh, I don't yeah. know. Thanks. Hey, Andrew, I know that the ADA has dipped their foot in the low-carb uh, diet pool. Do you think they're serious about it, or do you think they're uh, patronizing? Uh, I think that they're, uh, I think most institutional bodies, not even just ADA per se, but like anyone in general, I think any institutional body is hesitant to make any serious claims about something that doesn't have uh, essentially uh, bucket loads of long-term RCT data. The problem with that, though, is... We're, who's funding that? You know, because my understanding is that the ADA is not necessarily, they aren't, aren't funding those trials, even though it is the most popular uh, topic. Uh, maybe they are, uh, which would be awesome. But the problem is that what is expected to make recommendations has to be funded and it's not being funded. So um, I, I do think there is hesitance. I think the historical precedence around this diet has led people to, when uh, you know, the first, the principle, first do no harm. So if you have any prior data, historically, this diet has been deemed negative. Like actually my disease is the one that has brought about a negative tone towards ketones, even though the emergence of evidence over the last 10 years has said that ketones are actually remarkably good health tools. It's the acid component of the ketone body that was actually negative in type 1 diabetes and leading to early uh, complications and potentially death in patients. So we're obviously revisiting a lot of this science and reappreciating it. But the people who make the guidelines are those who have been around the longest and the most senior. And they also might be the people who have maybe the strongest sense of, uh, of, of their compass on these topics. But the, the evidence has completely shifted uh, over the last five years. So um, I don't know. I don't want to speak too much to why or why not, honestly, because I, I think that who knows? You know, but I do I do think one thing that I think is probably almost certain is that institutional bodies try to be careful about what they put out there because there's a, a huge consequences and benefits to whatever they say, and they will own and eat whatever they say, that's for sure. So um, I, it's definitely not in the mainstream. And I think anything out of the mainstream is going to be something that people are going to be really hesitant to back or give anything behind. But the, the truth is, you don't have a choice. It needs to be addressed because patients are doing it. And the absence of recommendation is no recommendation. And patients are going to do whatever the hell they want in the absence of that. So there needs to be some formalized recommendations, full stop, for what patients should do on this journey. Because right now we do have 17 studies and we know patients that are doing it in hordes. So uh, the absence of guidelines right now is actually hurting patients, in my opinion, and should be addressed. Um, can you speak to a follow-up? Can you speak to mineral loss and replacement when it creating an acidosis? Um, the literature that it's Dr. Good Kanawati, I never pronounce her name right. Uh, many of the side effects are related to mineral loss, such as weakness, cramps. Mm -hmm. What's your experience? Yeah. yeah, so that's that's definitely true. It has been well cited. McSweeney, 2018, 2016, actually. Um, there have been some studies out of a group from Jeff Volek, who's been doing low-carb diets for almost 20 years now. Those are familiar with his name. Um, this topic is one that, uh, uh, so a lot of the adverse side effects, some people can get something called a keto flu, okay, they get a headache, they get fatigue, they get lethargic. Uh, a lot of that has been hypothesized as the individual who noted that question um, from mineral loss, particularly sodium, because when you go on a low carbohydrate diet, and actually one of the things many patients with hypertension experience is uh, lowering a blood pressure. And, and the reason for that um, is because you're depleting a lot of, not depleting, but like, flushing out a lot of sodium. Insulin brings sodium and water in uh, to the body. 
And so the absence of those carbohydrates is, is going to deplete a lot of that inherent sodium in the diet, which is why blood pressure lowers a lot of times. You have to be careful about hypertensive meds on patients who are on them when you go on this diet. Um, and we actually know that ketone bodies themselves can have an antihypertensive effect on the vasculature. So uh, to which we don't fully know yet, but there's work out of a group, McCarthy, and I think he's at USC, University of Southern California, looking at these topics. So, um, but yes, uh, what people often recommend is to uh, supplement with sodium, um, a good bit actually, like a gram per meal, um, which sounds like, uh, you know, that make the a AHA, you know, croak saying something like that. But the truth is that's what's been recommended and it's been done in the side of literature to combat some of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, uh, before you hit on this, the, you know, there's lots of theories of diets out there. Uh, yeah. Some that are listed here by someone, fruitarian diet, raw vegan diet, any other experiences with any of those? Uh, did, did you have those and then failed or? or um, so I've actually done like a, uh, so I, I never really tried a full, uh, I've done a vegetarian diet very short period, but it's actually low carb. So I've actually done a low carb vegetarian diet. Um, I have a friend who is an orthopedic surgeon who has type 1 diabetes. She is a mom as well, uh, who is actually a full-fledged um, vegetarian because she has autoimmune issues that stem beyond um, type 1 diabetes. And so she's actually successful doing that approach. Um, she actually has talks online, if anyone's interested in seeing that. Her name is Carrie Dulles. Um, and so other forms of these diets. So I've done like uh, flexible dieting um, uh Man, there's a lot of diets I've tried, to be honest with you. Um, I've done vegetarian, but it was low carb. So something called like an eco Atkins. Um, I've done intermittent fasting. In fact, a lot of times I do that just not because I, I'm not trying to quote intermittently fast. I just happen to do that. I don't eat when I'm hungry and I eat when I need to, which is usually after I work out or right before bed. And that's pretty much it. Uh, not right before bed, but like dinner. And uh, so I've done a number of these diets, but I haven't done a few of them. Like I haven't done like a carnivore diet. I haven't done um, a FODMAP diet. I haven't done a few of these, but I've tried Whole30. I've tried flexible dieting. I've tried um, many of these approaches. And I, I honestly, truthfully, when it comes to type 1 diabetes and the management of type 1 diabetes, what we're essentially talking about here is matching the food kinetics of glucose to the current medications of insulin and the kinetics of insulin. So how quickly does glucose cause insulin elevations to go up and how quickly can insulin bring it down? And unfortunately, the most, the most rapid insulins we have today don't match the rapidly absorbed elevation in glucose from carbohydrates. That's where the disconnect happened. It's because best pharmacokinetics we have and drugs don't match the, the rapid absorption and elevation of blood glucose in carbohydrates. So in short, you're chasing your tail all the time. And that's why it never matches. But if you remove that form of the, the, the carbohydrates from the diet and you start using slower acting insulins like regular insulin or uh, delayed boluses to match protein, uh, one, the mistakes are much smaller, the doluses are much smaller, and you have a much more reliable chance of actually hitting the mark, which is often the case. Why? Because you can see in those tracings I showed you, it isn't a flat line. I've experienced flat lines, but it's not a flat line. You're still dealing with these same problems at a lower amplitude in a much more manageable situation. You don't just like magically disappear with a disease. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but. Um, what about anti islet cell antibody, insulin antibodies and GAD 65 in antibodies? So I'm a little less familiar with the specifics. I, I guess I would have to ask you, what are they, what are they asking about? So is there a role for those? Are they important? Yeah. Autoantibodies to the, the, the pancreas and other tissues are, are commonly looked at for diagnosis. There's something called um, trial net, T1D trial net that is looking at antibodies and um, siblings. I think it's in siblings, children. I might, I might be misspeaking here, mm -hmm. uh, but it's looked at, it's being studied right now and autoimmunity pathology. There's also a trial called the, the environmental determinants of diabetes in youth. Um, uh, they're, but they're, they're all considering antibodies as a key metric in their onset criteria. Okay. Um, uh, one question is, do you have a, a, a protocol for, um, uh, you know, diagno diagnostic protocol? 
diagnostic protocol for type 1 diabetes, or you mean like intervention of doing a low carbohydrate diet in the context of a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes? Well, the question is, do you have a hormone protocol or lab tests for diabetes? So I, I, I think, you know, for, for your type 1. Okay. So what, what, yeah, so I don't have quote, a, a test. What the standard guidelines are when someone gets diagnosed, what happens is they test their finger blood stick and they're above 200 at an unknown period of time. And they have no relationship to the food. And that seems to be a, a surefire indicator. Okay, you got a problem. Uh, like it, 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 even if you had like a straight up Coke, you might get there if you're lucky, but usually you're not getting like 200. You're still going to come crashing right back down if you have normal metabolic response to glucose. If you're sitting at 200 and it's not coming back down, you got a problem and you might have type 1 diabetes. So that's, that's an easy one to do. You can also look at your HbA1c. We know HbA1c starts creeping up as you start losing beta cell function. Usually most type 1 diabetics are diagnosed with an HbA1c well above, well within the diabetic range. And these HbA1c metrics are two to three month averages. So we know that HbA1c as a diagnostic metric uh, is a indicator of early onset diabetes. So um, HbA1c glycemic metrics are kind of your uh, ways of detecting and, and getting diagnosed with type 1 of these most of the time. Hey, Doc, if I may, um, after volunteering with Doc for six and a half years, Dr. Clearfield, and you know, watching what he does with hormones, he stabilizes a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of diseases. And I'm now learning everything via hormones. So have you done research based on not sugars or blood sugars? but hormones and stabilizing the sugars and the blood sugars via hormones. So, uh, to, so I guess the best way to say this is the, the fundamental drug used to manage the disease is a hormone. It's insulin. So insulin is king in metabolism. Uh, it is the king regulator, uh, in my opinion, and I can definitely make the case for this. Uh, if, uh, anyone wants to play devil's advocate here, but insulin is the most potent, in my opinion, one of the most potent, if not the most potent metabolic regulator in the body. And that's what you have to take. I mean, that's what I have two forms of insulin right here that I take on a regular basis. So this disease is functionally managed by hormones uh, or a hormone in the form of insulin. Um, now, I, your question may extend a little bit beyond like what other hormones are being considered or regulated um, uh, beyond that? Well, I can tell you most people manage their disease in the absence of uh, just through insulin. The syringes, insulin, blood glucose meters are uh, usually the people who are going beyond that and looking at more advanced hormonal profiles are people who aren't the typical type 1 diabetic. There are people who are trying to take a step further in their health care uh, or their advanced care. And so those are not as common, but every type 1 diabetic, if they're planning to uh, live, is going to require uh, insulin unless they're able to in rare cases, a lot of patients can go on a very low carbohydrate diet. In some case reports, and I have heard of a number of patients reaching out to me anecdotally, they can go on a low carbohydrate diet post diagnosis in adulthood because it tends to be much more progressive in adults, like slower progression, and delay the full fledged like insulin requiring um, the need for insulin requirements uh, for years. But I don't know if that really gets to your question, but ultimately, to say like every patient's on it, a hormone right now to manage their disease and ultimately refined uh, management of other hormones it seems like a, a important consideration for general health it might be important beyond just type 1 diabetes you know in general um that's all the questions in the chat okay um any any final thoughts uh for us i, I just to say i appreciate the opportunity i mean i had that one of the biggest goals to get out and, and speak on this topic if anyone has any follow-up questions please just speak up um, okay. It's just get out and, and share a story from a disease that is, by its nature, um, probably one of the most unique, in my opinion, uh, in metabolism. The absence of insulin ultimately makes you the kingpin of your own metabolic regulation. I think insights from this give insights to many other diseases um, and how one might be able to optimize and manage overall health. So uh, with that, I just appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys and kind of speak on a topic Thank near you. and dear to my heart. So, Thank Anybody else have any, any questions or uh, comments? You're getting a lot of uh, kudos in the in the on, on the chat and great talk and thank you for being with us and we really course, appreciate yeah. we really appreciate it um, that um, you know you you spent this time with us um, we hope you'll come back uh, we won't bother you too often but maybe once or twice a year 
um, who hey. will kind of keep this going. Um, anybody, somebody else have something to say? Um, next week, we have Dr. our own Dr. Sulak. Dr. Dustin Sulak is going to give us an update on, he's he's our cannabis guy and uh, one okay. of them. And he's going to give us an update on what's new in 2022 for cannabis. So that's cool. next week. So if you you're more than welcome to join us and uh, uh, we'll be seeing you. It'll be uh, same time, same station, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And uh, it's always the same uh, link also. Um, so for everybody who gets that, we'll again, bring one friend so we can expand our, uh, our, uh, our group. So. Um, Dr. Kutnick, thank you so much. This was very informative. Um, and, um, you know, anything that we can do to, to help you with your, your research and your, um, you know, your, your, uh, your, your work, uh, we're, we're um, you know, we have a whole network of uh, folks that are um, a little bit outside of the box, so, so to speak. Well, I, I appreciate that. If you, do you know anyone who wants to address two of those big needs as far as like actually getting a, a trial off the ground to, to kind of solidify this and then also clinical guidelines that want to support something like that? You, you can pass them my way. I, I've been waiting. We have basically a protocol already set up and we already have clinical guidelines mapped out with the team. But uh, obviously nothing happens without a little bit of support. It's, it's the best way to put it. So. Dr. Burgess, where are you? Right I'm uh, I'm on the edge of my seat listening to every word, especially if you're interested in research. So mm -hmm. I'll be in contact with both of you guys and we'll talk about what might be done with that. This is exciting, important stuff affecting millions of people. So we're totally on your side, Dr. Kutnick. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, There's our that's our research. Uh, he, he's our <laughs> he's our research expert here. Awesome. And Dr. Halasa too. I think he might be off. You know, so and there's some serious beards there. Impressive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. You know, I'm the uh, I'm the I'm the outlier here. So. I'm not even gonna try to get that impressive. Like that's that's <laughs> that looks like father time. Like I have no shot at getting it that long. I'm yeah. cheating. Bioidentical hormone therapy. I'll just be honest. Okay. There you go. Yep. Yeah. I was, so, I was bald. Yeah. So, beer of the research beer that's amazing all right that's awesome well guys okay. i appreciate it. it's an honor to be here thank, thank you thank guys you for what so you do. much i know it's late back east so we'll uh we'll let you go thank you so much and uh we really appreciate it and uh, hey, uh hopefully we'll be in touch again okay all right good deal thank speak you. soon guys good night, everybody i'll have this uh we we put everything on our website by the way um you know we record okay. it if it's okay with you um, yeah that's good yeah aosrd.org slash webinars, all of our programs are on there. Did I spell it right? Yeah, I spelled it right. Um, no, no slash, it's a dot, it's a dot org, not a, not a slash org. So um, we're on, we're on um, all of our, our programs are on there and uh, we have quite a database. We have two years worth of, of, of work. Awesome, amazing, good for you guys. And uh, um, also coming up, uh, we, we're still talking to Noma about uh, maybe doing a, a brief uh, one or two day uh, program at, in South Lake Tahoe in the middle of January and it's ski season. So if you're skiers, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good place to go. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you some, in, some more information on that as, as things go along. So Nevada so Osteopathic that, Medical Association. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, with that, we'll say good night. And um, if anybody has any other questions, comments, um, and we'll get this out up on our website as soon as we can. And again, Dr. Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, we, we really appreciate it. John, I appreciate care. you guys. Enjoy Take your night, guys. Everybody. Thank you all. Good night.